Monday, Monday, world economic news starting in the New York Times. After the Fed's action, watching inflation's trajectory by Floyd Norris. The core rate of inflation fell to a record low in the United States last month, rekindling fears of deflation and warnings that the Federal Reserve might have to take even more aggressive steps to keep inflation as high as it wants it to be. In the short run, disinflationary forces in Western economies, especially the United States, appear too powerful to be overwhelmed by the recent loosening of monetary policy, said Richard Batty, an investment strategist at Standard Life Investments. Since the collapse of the housing market in the United States and the beginning of the global financial crisis, the Federal Reserve has made avoiding deflation a major priority. Recalling the experience of Japan after its bubble burst in the early 1990s, the Fed has set an annual inflation target of 2% or a little lower, but still is not getting it. And we have the chart, another of those superimposed charts, United States over Japan, and deflation is going downwards. Disinflationary pressures, just like Japan. Not a yes man's economics blog, it's worth following. And his article here, The Long-Term Future for Ireland and My View on Inflationary Trends in the UK and the US. Now for this I'm going to pick, pick out the Irish component, or at least one paragraph of it, where he writes, Moving on to actual details then, the issue of Ireland's low corporation tax rate, which is 12.5%, seems to have become something of a stumbling block with Ireland wishing to keep it, and both Germany and France wanting it to be raised. Of course, as I have written before, many organisations which include both Google and U2 use Ireland as a way of paying much lower tax rates than even the headline 12.5%. But the fundamental problem is that Ireland is asking for help from some countries which on paper, on per capita basis, are poorer than Ireland is whilst poaching international business from them with a lower tax rate. That must stick in the craws of the poorer countries in the Eurozone. Indeed. Bloomberg. Irish corporate tax rates increase isn't a condition for aid, says so, says so Sarkozy. Sarkozy. Ireland won't be required to raise its corporate tax rates as part of the European Union bailout, French President Nicolas Sarkozy said, addressing an issue that looms as a stumbling block, block to an aid agreement. When uh, you have to tackle a deficit, you have to lever the spending and taxes, Sarkozy said yesterday in Lisbon at the summit of NATO leaders. I cannot believe that our Irish friends in full sovereignty won't look at both since they have more room for manoeuvre given that their tax rates are lower, but that's not a demand or a condition, just an opinion. Yeah. Guardian Co. UK, an article by Mark Weinsbrot, Weisbrot. There is another way for bullied Ireland. The EU authorities and the IMF are telling the Irish there's no alternative to their brutal bailout conditions. And that's just so wrong. Crappy article, but I've pu pulled out one piece of the crap. If you want to see how right-wing and 19th century brutal the European authorities are being, just compare them to Ben Bernanke, the Republican chair of the US Federal Reserve. He recently initiated a second round of quantitative easing, or creating money. Another $600 billion over the next six months. And today he made it clear, and that's a link to a Washington Post link where he doesn't make it clear, that the purpose of such money creation was so that the federal government could use it for another round of fiscal stimulus. The ECB could do something similar. Let's go back a bit. And today he made it clear, and that's a link to the Washington Post, 
which has got a video of two minute clip of the Bernanke speech to the ECB where he doesn't make it clear that the purpose of such money creation was so that the federal government could use it for another round of fiscal stimulus the ECB could do something similar now this man I checked is a PhD in economics has a PhD in economics so we can put aside incompetence because I'm sure he wouldn't like to be called incompetent in economics that only leaves the fact that he's a lying little shit. Just one more time, for him. Today he made it clear, where he didn't, that the purpose of such money creation was so that the federal government could use it for another round of fiscal stimulus. The ECB could do something similar. Now, again, that's factually inaccurate. If not for its rightist ideology and politics, if not for its rightist ideology and politics, now, to me, this is quite obvious that this is left-wing ideology and politics, which seems that it makes people's brains turn to mush and turns them into lying little shits. They, they'll lie for their, whatever it might be, political ideology. And it's a shame, because so many of these people get on the media telling us this is this and that is that, when it clearly isn't. Moving on. Two, rebalancing the global recovery. Remarks by Ben S. Bernanke, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System at the 6th European Central Bank Central Banking Conference in Frankfurt, Germany, November 19th, 2010. May I be forgiven, but I have read the entire speech. I've picked out one part where Ben says... Incidentally, do you want my funny voice for Ben? You probably do. And I'll come back to the other point. Incidentally, in my view, the use of the term quantitative easing to refer to the Federal Reserve's policy is inappropriate. Quantitative easing typically refers to policies that seek to have effect by changing the, the quantity of bank reserves. Uh, a channel which seems relatively weak, at, at least in the U.S. context. Uh, in contrast, securities purchases work by affecting the yields on acquired securities and via substitution effects in invest investors' portfolios on a wider range of assets. Now, the voice didn't help you understanding. Ben Bernanke's speech was to European Central Bankers, so he's speaking... Um, to what us is gobbledygook. So I'll just go back and go through it because it's not that complicated. Incidentally, in my view, the word, the use of the term quantitative easing to refer to Federal Reserve's policies is inappropriate. Quantitative easing typically refers to policies that seek, seek to affect, to have effects by changing the quantity of bank reserves. A channel, he's accepting that that's what quantitative easing generally does, and it does, it changes the amount of reserves, but not the whole quant the quantity of money. A channel which seems relatively weak, at least in the US context. And the next uh, sentence, which we'll concentrate on, because it's describing the uh, QE2 that I was speaking to so many people uh, on Saturday about on the YouTubes, in contrast, securities purchases, buying treasuries from banks, work by affecting the yields on acquired securities and via substitution effects in investors' portfolios. The investors' portfolios are the banks and there is a substitution effect where they had treasuries and now they have cash. Treasuries, cash, cash, treasuries. When the Fed prints up money, which it does from nowhere. It buys treasuries off the bank's books and replaces that on the bank's books with cash. The banks had treasuries and now they have cash. It is a substitution effect, which will work by affecting the yields on the acquired securities. The effect of quantitative easing is to affect the yield curve, the interest rate on treasuries. That is all. The hope is that if the interest rate comes down, more people will borrow. End of. Moving on to My Budget 360, who um, is always punting for the US middle class. 
when uh, but always has a t wonderful chart porn but a tendency to a rather long uh, article titles when peak credit implodes on the consumer balance sheet one trillion in consumer debt has been removed from the market since 2008 only consumer debt category growing is student loan debt student loan debt's the only one that's going up and unfortunately you can't get rid of that one with bankruptcy uh, first chart up is the color, what I'm calling the colorful chart that I've used, I don't know, half a dozen times lately, and it's the great sweeping up, and now it's coming down um, with obviously mortgages making up the, the 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 major amount, and that's coming down, but all the others are coming down except the aforementioned student loans con. Next is total revolving credit, um, St. Louis Fed, and that is down and staying down. Next is commercial and industrial loans at all commercial banks, in other words, banks loaning to um, businesses, and it is horrifically down. Going back to 1960, it's down further and longer than at any other time. This is what Bank Bernanke is trying to affect with quantitative easing. He is, by substituting cash into uh, the bank, onto the bank's books, I can't go into why it works now, it's slightly more complicated, but all that happens is that the the interest rate should come down and hopefully uh, people or private people and businesses will come in and demand loans banks can always make loans they don't need cash on their books at all to make loans they can always make loans but they need somebody sitting there across the desk asking for a loan first and that's what Bernanke is trying to uh, manufacture low interest rates so people come in for loans Finish with the Telegraph. IMF's Dominique Strauss-Kahn wants fiscal and reform powers given to Europe. Subheading, a federal Europe with more sovereign power ceded to the centre is the best defence against any future crisis the head of the International Monetary Fund has declared. And uh, towards the bottom I'll read these two paragraphs. Referring to the crisis he said, I won't do a, uh, might do a French accent because it's a different French accent. The Eurozone area institutions were simply not up to the task. Uh, even setting up a temporary solution proved to be a drawn-out process. Uh, one solution is to shift the main responsibility for enforcement of fiscal discipline and key structural reforms away from the Council, the European Council. This would minimize the risk of narrow national interests interfering with effective implementation of the common rules. What did you say, Dominic? What did you say there? I said this would minimize the risk of narrow national interests interfering with effective implementation of the common rules. This would minimize the risk of narrow national interests interfering with the effective implication, implementation of the common rules. He's been in Germany too long. He's a socialist git at his base anyway. And he's been in a position of power. And he thinks now, with all this power that he had, if he just had a little more, he could make everything perfect. This would minimise the risk of narrow national interests interfering with effective implementation of common rules. Do you understand what that means? Narrow national interests, in other words... <laughs> you get it? I'll just run the next paragraph. In proposals that are likely to play into the hands of Eurosceptics in the UK and elsewhere, Mr Strauss-Kahn recommended more tax harmonisation and a larger central budget for the Euro area. He said that labour market reforms need to be centralised, saying it is time to create a level playing field for European workers, especially in the area of labour taxation, social benefit systems and portability and employment protection legislation. In other words, central everything in his hands he's a political ideologue and I'm thinking more and more these political people should be shunned shun them like you would shun a rabid dog have a good week <laughs>